All righty. We, we, as we said, we started the beginning of the year teaching on uh, Egypt just ain't all that. And I was kind of, I kind of got, uh, not tickled, but, you know, sometimes it's good, good to know you're in, in the same kind of flow. My pastor uh, that we came up under and down in Greenville, he's on vacation, and he posts this, this thing on Friday about Egypt, about how people, you know, about, you know, Egypt, and they're not, they're, they're kind of like living in Egypt, they're not getting separated from the things of the world. And there's a long post, and he's on his vacation. I thought, man, pastor, you, you know, I just got through preaching, Egypt just ain't all that. And uh, we, we don't, there's nothing back there, as we said before, there's nothing back where you came out of that's worth going back and getting, you know? Hallelujah. You know, you ever, you ever left somewhere, and you're, you're going down the road, oh, I forgot my, my hair bow at the hotel room. Well, we're not driving 60 miles to get the hair bow. It just ain't worth it. You know what I'm saying? And the things you left behind in Egypt, they're just not worth it. It just ain't worth it. So no need going back. It's not worth it. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And then we, we, we uh, <coughs> to use a new modern term, segued into that. Okay, the old term dovetailed. Or just downright southern, we hooked on to that with growing up into him. Because let me say something. If you're not going to go back into Egypt, you're going to have to grow up. Okay? And so we cover growing up into him out of Ephesians chapter 4. Not being children, tossed to and fro, speaking the truth and love, so forth. And so then we got into that, you know, that we grow by the word, we mature by the word. But we, we have to walk in love. And that's what kind of where we, we were leaving off last week was developing a love walk. Now, I know that, the, that Paul wrote to the church and said, I believe it's either in Romans 5, 8 or 8, 5, I forget them sometimes, that the love of God has been shed abroad in our heart by the Holy Ghost. You know, there's a lot, you know, he's shed the love of God abroad in your heart, but if you don't act on it, it won't work. You know, he's dealt to every man the measure of faith. I've seen people not use the faith they've been dealt. Okay? So we have to grow up. Amen? <clears throat> and we have to grow in love. So we're talking about, you know, that you know, we're, not to be, we're not to be children anymore. That um, according to 1 Corinthians 13, 11, we're to put away childish things. Amen. We're to grow up into the fullness of the measure of the stature of Christ. But we're part of the same body. Now, that's where we're going to tie in here. We're going to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and then we'll run into 1 Corinthians 13. Uh, let's go on down. Um, I tell you, let's just go ahead and read from verse 14 through the end of the chapter, chapter 12. It says, for the body is not one member, but many. And if the foot shall say, because I'm not of the hand, I am not of the body, it is therefore not of the body. And if the ear shall say, because I'm not the eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? And if the whole were a hearing, where were the smelling? Now, a lot of times we we'll use these scriptures and talking about people who want to, you know, everybody wants to be the preacher, everybody wants to be in charge, whatever. We use that, you know, to kind of cover that. You know, we can't have, you know, uh, the old Indian term or the term among, you know, too many chiefs, not enough engines. You know, you're, you're, you, know, oh, you can't say, well, my wife's a lot of Cherokee, so if she doesn't get offended about it, you shouldn't, all right? You know, everybody wants to be in charge. To, to me, bosses, not enough workers. Yeah. Hallelujah. <clears throat> if the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? But now hath God set members in the church, every, in the body, everyone as it's pleased him. Now, if, you're, if you are the toe, God put you there and it made him happy. So be happy. If whatever God made you in the body, be happy with it. Do not desire another role if you are, listen, you know, if, if the little toe started getting upset because it wasn't the heart and it tried to be the heart, you know what happens? You'd fall down all the time because your, your little toe is a major part of your balance. And though, you, though it's stuck in a shoe with smelly, uh, you know, odors down there and all that kind of stuff, and you take it off and it's my pastor used to say, Fumunda cheese down there, what do you mean, Fumunda your toes? And we, uh, this is just a side journey right there. They just took, some scientists took, you know, uh, the sweat and stuff from under people's o toes and armpits and made cheese out of it. I don't know why you'd want to eat it. So it's from under cheese. It's from under your toes. They actually did it. Be careful what you say. Somebody might go do it. And, you think, and, you, and then all I can think is, Why? Toe cheese. You know, you go in the grocery store, you got sharp cheddar, you got, you know, mild cheddar, you got Monterey Jack, and you got toe cheese. Oh, they got a grant. That's why they did it. You paid for it. All right. Let's just leave that from under cheese stuff alone. 
And if they were all member, uh, if they were all one member, where were the body? But now are many members, yet one body. The eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee. Nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of thee. Nay, much more these members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, upon them we bestow more abundant honor, and our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. And it's just basically saying the things like, you, you know, parts that you, you know, listen, nobody cares you know, what your toe looks like. People look at your faces. You know what I'm saying? You're not going to whip out your toe and put it out there and they go, Woo, you good looking toe, you. Unless you're weird. Anyway, we have straight jackets for people like that. <laughs> Hallelujah. For our comely parts have no need, but God hath tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that part which lacked. That there should be no schism in the body. Now understand that this is an allegory, and we're not really, you know, really spending a lot of time on body image and that kind of stuff. He's talking about the body of Christ, using the physical body as an allegory. There should no, be no schism in the body. You shouldn't be upset because you're not doing this or not doing that, and somebody else is. That's, that's not right. Okay, that's a schism in the body that shouldn't be there. We're, we're to walk in love, amen? We're, to, we're to, to honor one another. And like I said last week, if you take a sledgehammer and hit your big toe, the rest of the body will we'll re react to it. Yeah. Yeah. Amen? I mean, how many have ever hit your thumb? I mean, blood going everywhere, mud, whatever, where does it go? 90% of the time it goes right in your mouth. You're thinking, you didn't care if there was blood, you didn't care if there was mud. That, you know, it needed, it needed some kind of nurturing and you put it in your mouth. I did it. I mean, a number of years ago, I was helping somebody uh, do some work on a church. I, they were putting in some sound stuff, and I was helping them on the side. And I had, I had a, my hand on this. I was on a, on a scaffold, and it was, it was six-inch steel studs, and they were the heavier gauge. And I, was, and I was trying to get the sheet rock. I was trying to get something screwed back in there. And I had the drill like this. I had every bit of pressure I could physically put on that to get that thing to bite. And had it wound up. And that screw did like this, and when it did, that, that drill came off and just went, the drill head, the Phillips drill head, went right through my thumb. Right here on the corner and out the other side. <laughs> Hallelujah. That thumb went right in my mouth. Mm. Then when I pulled it out and saw what I had done, you know, I mean, I, help me, help. Jesus. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm dancing. <laughs> Neosporin and tape and stuff. A few minutes later, I was back at it. It hurt. Oh, it hurt. Now, it took three years for the feeling to come back in there after it healed. The nerve endings were just, just wound up. That's why my wife doesn't go anywhere when I'm working. <laughs> Hallelujah. <clears throat> Amen. But you know what? The rest of my body came to my thumb's aid. And this is what Paul's saying. The rest of the body should be coming to our aid when we're hurt, not knocking us, kicking us out the front door. Amen? We should, we should be coming to aid when people are injured and hurt. Hallelujah. So if one suffers, we all suffer. Or if one member's honored, we all members rejoice with it. Hallelujah. Now, we are the body of Christ and members in particular. You're the, if you're born again, you're part of the body of Christ. Amen? Now, let me say something here. We gotta, gotta, you know, we gotta be, we gotta be balanced in this. Now, if somebody's hurt, we don't kick them out, but we do minister to them. You know, if, if you're, if, you know, if, we, if a brother's overtaken in fault, we go and minister to them and tell them, hey, this isn't right, this is wrong. That's biblical. You just don't, you just don't just ignore what they're doing. Go up. <laughs> well, they'll find out for themselves. That's not, that's not love. Now, don't get, if somebody comes to you and says, you know, I, I think this is the wrong thing, don't get mad with them. Amen. If you don't agree with them, you know, you could not agree with them, at least understand that they love you. That's why they did it. They didn't do it because they hate you. If they didn't like it, they say, well, <laughs> good, let them just follow that for themselves. They'll, 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 they'll run into a tough place, and, <laughs> and I'll be laughing while they are. That's not love. Right. You know, helping somebody arrest themselves is love. Amen. Amen. And so we, we, we find a balance there. If somebody's in sin or whatever, we need to love on them. You know, it's not love to go, go hey, I saw so-and-so last week out doing such and such. Can you believe that? That's not love. No. Telling them, say, hey, I saw it. That's love. You know, you need to repent. That's love. Amen? 
Now you're members of the, your body, your body of Christ, members in particular, and God set some in the church. First apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. Are all apostles? These, these are rhetorical questions. The answer understood here is not yes. Okay? The answer understood here is no. Okay? Are all prophets? No. Are all teachers? No. Are all workers of miracles? No. In other words, you were operating the gift of the working of miracles. Okay? Have all the gifts of healings? No. Do all speak with tongues? Now, not tongues for, the, as, as everybody being filled with the Holy Ghost and speaking in tongues. This is the gift of tongues with interpretation. That's a different whole different thing. That's a ministry gift. That is a ministry of tongues. Not everybody has the ministry of tongues. Not everybody has that. Amen? No more than everybody has the gifts of working of miracles or the gifts of healing or word of wisdom or word of knowledge or prophecy. Not everybody flows in all those gifts or any of those gifts. As so, as so. Anybody can be filled with the Holy Spirit and speak in tongues as a private prayer language, but not everybody has a ministry. Now, the strongest ministry I ever saw, I personally ever saw, along those lines of tongues and interpretation of tongues was Buddy and Pat Harrison. Never, now, they got it from Brother and Sister Goodwin. And, uh, and, people, and I've talked with people, and that's where, and, you know, that's where they got it from. They, they were in the ministry of Brother and Sister Goodwin, and that's where they got it from. <clears throat> but I personally only saw Brother, Buddy and Pat operating this together. The strongest manifestation of tongues and interpretation of tongues I've ever seen. Pat would give tongues and Buddy would interpret. I remember the first time I ever saw him. It was at camp meeting in 1980 out in Tulsa. I had just, you know, we just got to Tulsa in time for camp meeting. And, uh, and here I am, this first big meeting I've ever been in. I mean, the biggest thing I ever, had ever been in was the Piney Grove camp meeting down in Piney Grove, North Carolina, where Laverne Tripp got saved and filled with the Holy Ghost. That's where he grew up in Grimesland, North Carolina, or Chocowitt. He just down, just about 20 miles from where I grew up. And uh, that was his camp meeting. Brother, Brother Laverne was Pentecostal holiness. Hallelujah. And, that, and you want to know what kind of building it was? It was cinder block walls about that high, which screened the rest of the way, you know, and, and a roof on it, and yellow bug lights on the inside. No air conditioning with ceiling fans. Well, but we had a good time in the Lord. You can have a good time in the Lord with ceiling fans and yellow lights. Amen. Boy, so some folks now, if they had to go in something like that, they wouldn't even go. I mean, hard benches with no backs. I mean, it was, it was an old camp meeting. I mean, that was uptown because it was indoors. It wasn't under a brush arbor with tree trunks cut off and, you know, and, and uh, a tent put over top of you. <laughs> How do we had ceiling fans. Woo, praise God. But I showed up at Tulsa that, you know, about then, back then, a camp meeting ran about, uh, about 17,000 or so registered for the week, which is right many people. You know, the assembly center only holds 10, but they would, they would register over the week about 17 to 18,000 people. And um, one of the night meetings, you know, as uh, the service was getting going, Brother Buddy was, was there and Pat, and, and Pat ran up and grabbed the microphone. I didn't know who she was. I didn't know she was Dad Hagen's daughter. And she starts going around speaking in tongues, and she's doing all these motions, and she's standing, in, and she's doing this, and, and she whoo, and does this, and grabs a tree and bends it, one of the platform trees, kind of like one of these over the side, bends it over and stands up, and she falls out in the spirit. Then Brother Run Buddy runs up and grabs the microphone, and he starts interpreting. And every motion that she was making, when he gave the interpretation of it, it made sense. And he was mimicking everything she did. Grabbed the trend, talking about the wind of the Spirit is blowing, and boom, he went out. And this Pentecostal holding this boy had been around tongues and stuff. He'd never seen that before. And I'm going to tell you, I went, I'm like, yeah, I'm with the Holy Ghost. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> and over the years, we, we saw them minister that way and just never seen anybody minister that kind of flow, that strong, that anointed uh, actually, before or since, I haven't ever seen it. Now, I've been, I'm sure there are other people who do. I just haven't been around them. But Brother Buddy and Pat just flowed in that gift and flowed in that manner and just ministered that way, and it was, it was a blessing to the body of Christ. So just saying that, when he says here, do I all speak with tongues, it's not talking about being filled with the Holy Ghost in 13 and 14. It's talk, I mean, I mean in, in, in chapter 14, it's talking about ministering in tongues. And there's a difference. I'm just, we're just going to jump off here. You know, I, I, don't, I like getting to places and just jumping off when the Holy Ghost leads me. Uh, you know, sometimes when you minister to people, well, not sometimes, anytime you're ministering to somebody, just keep your opinion to yourself. When they come and ask you what you think, if you can't give them what the Holy Ghost is saying, shut up. Because you'll mess them up. Now, I've ministered to some people, and one, one person I'm thinking about right now, they've, been, they've gone through a hard place in life, and they're, they're getting, they're, people are coming up and giving them a counsel, and giving them, not counsel, giving them their opinion, calling it counsel. 
Let me say that when people begin to ask you for your opinion and ask you to help them, you know, you need to be able to say, listen, I need, I, we, need, we don't need what I think about this. We don't need my opinion about this. You don't even need what I would do about this. What you need is the wisdom that comes out of the realm of the Spirit because the wisdom of God is what's going to help you through this situation. Amen. Amen. Now, a person came back to me and said, you know, uh, I, I listened to what you said. I, and I, you know, it said it helped me. It kind of slapped me in a good way. You know, because they had told me stuff people, stuff people were telling them. People were just giving them their opinions. You gotta, we have to come to the point, if I don't have the anointing to minister to what I'm, I'm talking to a person about, then I don't need to say anything because the, my opinion won't break the yoke in their life. The anointing will destroy the yoke and remove the burden. The counsel of God will do it. Amen. And so you just say, listen, you know, here it is. Here's what the Bible says. I don't want to give you my opinion because my opinion may not be proper. My opinion may come from my experience about it. Listen, you get somebody uh, who's, who's um, you get a woman who's, who's had maybe a, a tough relationship. And another woman's going through a tough relationship. And she begins to counsel from her experience, not from the anointing. Well, on the surface it might look similar but you're going to interject all your emotion and all your feeling and all your stuff into it and not the anointing. She don't need your experience. Her experience is bad enough. She needs something to destroy the yoke and remove the burden in her life. And so she needs the anointing and the word of God. She doesn't need your experience. I kick into the curb. Well, maybe your, your bozo was about real bozo. Maybe hers just needs some help. Amen. Maybe he was an absolute you know, low-life jerk who needed to be kicked to the curb. But your, hers may not be. Maybe his is, is salvageable. We have to minister under the anointing of God if we're going to help people. And so if you don't have something, don't pretend like you got it. If you're not anointed to address it, Say, look, right now, here's all I can do. I can, I can show you what the Bible says about it and let you read it and let the Holy Ghost minister. I don't want to give you my opinion. Amen. Do not minister to people under the guise of the anointing for healing. Now, you can say, look, the Bible says we'll lay hands with the sick and they'll recover. But I'm not going to tell you and let, and let you believe that I'm anointed with some kind of special healing anointing right now. Because if they're putting their faith in the fact that you might have an anointing, their faith is misplaced. So what do you do? I'm doing what the Bible says. The Bible says that the believers will lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. So in obedience to the scripture, so what? You're pointing them to the Bible for their faith. Not to the fact that I've got a gift of healing operating in me right now. Amen. See, we have to understand our roles and our place in the body of Christ and what we have. And if, listen, if you've got anointing on you and it's on you, let them know. Hey, the anointing of God's on me right now. This isn't me. This is the anointing of the Holy Ghost. They can have faith in that if it's there. But don't pretend. Don't begin to give words where you shouldn't be giving words. As a matter of fact, I'm trying to get to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, but the Holy Ghost just unhooked my whole train. <coughs> I was going to say something right there. Yeah, I know as a matter of fact, that's what I said. That's the last thing I said. Yes. Just because you got a goosebump don't mean you have a revelation from heaven. I've had goosebumps watching demon commercials for movies. And it won't the Holy Ghost. Have y'all ever had that? Some, the, the, some of those paranormal activity commercials, you sit and watch TV and that thing comes on, you're going, and you know there's devils all over it. And I got, you got chills. It wasn't God. God don't get a chill in front of a devil. Amen. And so when we're, when we're going, to, when we're talking to people and we're sharing with people, don't, don't start going, yea, thus saith the Lord. No. It's easy to say, yea, thus saith the Lord. But the Bible teaches you, if you're going, yea, thus saith the Lord, it, show up at my office and let me and somebody else judge it. Well, it's a private matter, not according to the Word of God. 
If you're going to speak by prophecy and speak things and utterance, it is to, especially when you're speaking to people about direction in life, it's to be judged. Yeah. Well, who do you think you are? The pastor who's anointed the pastor. Right. I'm just getting more and more bold about that. I'm anointed to do this. Yeah. Yeah. There's an anointing on me to judge whether or not you're speaking by the Holy Ghost or not. Yeah. And I'll tell you, if more people did that, we'd have less messed up lives. Oh, the Lord showed me you're supposed to, oh, you're supposed to come help me in the ministry. Really? I had one guy come to our church one time and got people leading worship off to the side and tried to get in the mood to another country with him. And he came to me after and says, I knew you wouldn't mind. I hate to tell him the next words out of my mouth was, yes, I do. What, what, what do you mean come and trying to steal my, my worship team because they're good? They're going to help your ministry. They're helping mine right now. What makes, what makes it, that, you know, yours so important that you're going to rob mine? Right. Go find your own. Yeah, right. Let God bring you your own. You know, and, and under the guise, God showed me you ought to be working with me. Well, God didn't show me, and I'm their pastor. Exactly. So when you sow seed in people like that, and it'll begin to grow in them. All that kind of stuff goes on. Words, words need to be judged. Not everybody's called to prophesy. Right, right. <laughs> We, back in our home church that we came out of, about every week this woman would stand up to give a word. I mean, we could be flowing and going, whoa, glory to God, right in the middle of the flow of the Holy Ghost. And she'd open her mouth, and it's like the whole building, the roof came off, and a great big bucket of cold water just got done. <laughs> Felt like you just got dashed by your team after winning the ball game. The Gatorade bucket got you. She'd open her mouth, and I mean just a, and uh, was enough to kill the whole move. Am I wrong, honey? No, what? No, I'm wrong. Finally, the pastor had to sit him down and tell him, don't do that. Then we had Brother Amen. He had this deep, resounding voice. He didn't need a microphone. You know how bass he is. It carried the whole building. He, I mean, you'd say the, the devil is getting after people. Amen. He thought he was prophesying amens. No. Are all teachers. Listen, listen, folks. If we don't ask you to minister, maybe it's because you're not called to. If you're not standing behind the pulpit preaching and never doing that, maybe it's because you're not called to. Not all the teachers. Not everybody's a teacher. Hello, nobody can preach. But I've seen people get mad because they, they didn't get to do this or do that. Now, you can't do that. Don't do that. Are all helps, all governments, all diversity of tongues, are all apostles, prophets, I'm sorry, then gifts, helps, governments, diversity of tongues. Have all the gifts of healings, do all speak with tongues, do all interpret? No. Cover earnestly the best gifts, and yet I show you two a more excellent way. Now, we're to covet after God using us however he, he desires to use. That's the best gift. If God's gift use of you, and please don't take me wrong here. But if the best use of you is working in the nursery, then rejoice because that's God how God wants to use you. And do it with all your heart and be a blessing. That is not demeaning. Somebody's got to watch those little rascals. Somebody's got to change their diapers. Amen. Are you here? Someone has to allow the parents, a break from the routine of always never being away from the children to hear the Word of God, an opportunity to hear the Word of God. Amen. Now, I don't think that, you know, I don't think parents should be never working in the nursery, but I don't think they should be in there every week, in every service. Okay? Well, I don't want to do that. You know, it's, it's, it's below me. There's nothing below you in the body of Christ. Amen. Let me say something. You don't know how important it is to the image and flow of the church for the toilets to be clean and the bathroom floor to be clean and there to be toilet paper in the bathroom? That's a big one. The trash to be carried out. Man, you know, you go in, the, you understand, in the men's bathroom, we have urinals, and if that thing don't get flushed and sits there all week, 
Can you, can you, can you do like a Medea's movie? That's just nasty. Brown, that's nasty. Who's your mama? Medea, that's just nasty. That's just nasty. What a difference it makes to come into the church and the bathrooms are clean and ready to go. The floors are clean. There's no paper laying everywhere. Everything's set up. You don't think that's valuable to their operation of the ministry? It's vital. And the last thing you need, and, and it's not that I'm blessed, is I did this. I'm not talking about things I didn't do. I did them. Okay? And it's not that I pay my dues and never have to go back. But the pastor doesn't need to be going in and going, my God, the bath somebody please come clean these bathrooms or he's in there having to do it himself because they're dirty right before church and get distracted about other things other than the church. Now, it hasn't happened, but I'm just I'm trying to make you understand. If that's what you're doing, you're important. Your role is important. What you're doing is important. It's not visible. People don't, people don't come in and go, Lord, the bathrooms are so clean this morning. I'm so, oh, it's just wonderful. But let them not be clean and see what's said. Let them be stopped up Wednesday and nobody took care of it by Sunday. Everybody will know about it. So a lot of things we do in the body of Christ go unnoticed. Doesn't mean they're not important. They are valuable to the church. And a lot of the things that are, you know, just because the other things are public and everybody sees it, and people are people. Now, we used to have a worship leader everybody thought was my wife. All the visitors thought they were, she was my wife. Just because they were so prominent and they kind of promenaded themselves. Okay? And we had, no, that's not my wife. That's my wife over there. She's back over here teaching your kids. Now, am I wrong? Is this, am I wrong? Didn't that happen? Numerous times. You know? See, we look at somebody in the forefront, and we, and we start put, putting honor on them that doesn't belong there. Right. Hello? Now, my wife's over here teaching the kids. Right. My wife may make 30 services out here a year, because she's always teaching the kids somewhere. Uh -huh. right. Because that's her ministry, is your children and the children that have come before and the children that will come after. Uh -huh. right. That's her calling, and that's her anointing. And she loves those little gas rascals. Uh -huh. I love kids, so I'm, I'm not trying to, I'm not going to, well... You know, curtain climber or cookie uh, crumb snatchers. I mean, that's a, I say that adorably. I don't mean that in a bad way. You know? And when I, when I substitute West and I get the little first graders and stuff, I'm big dog. The middle court circle is the dog house, and the center circle of the middle court is the big dog house. So when I'm seven, they all come out there and bark. Of course, I give the big dog bark. And they're all going, beep, 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 beep. It's adorable. I'll come, through a, I'll come through the school and day I'm not subbing, and they're all going, big dog. And the teachers are all going, big dog. Hey, guys. <laughs> I've even got the other, uh, other PE teachers calling me Coach Big Dog. Now, Coach Big Dog over here, I walked through the gym the other day, and I had a class, and I, I, didn't, I, I thought it was one place. And as I walked out the door, I heard him going, where's Coach Big Dog going? I said, oh, I'm supposed to be in there. <laughs> <clears throat> but the little guys would come up and grab my legs and, and hug my legs and all that kind of stuff and look up at you. So I love the kids. But my wife's called to the kids. And so she's, out, she's not out here where you see her all the time. A lot, a lot of churches, they, they make sure the pastor's wife is forefront, you know, when you know, they glamorize her. She, she really don't like that. She'd rather be over there with the kids. She's doing her calling. Amen. But we don't need, you know, just because someone is more public doesn't mean that they're more important. Okay? People who run the sound room and, and work in there and people who greet people when they walk in the front door and, and all the things it takes to run a church. Those are valuable and important parts of the body of Christ. So maybe you're not prophesying. Let me tell you, if you're not anointed to do it, we don't want you doing it and you don't want to be doing it. You don't want to mess somebody's life up just so you could be seen. We had, when we first came to Greensboro, there was a couple in the church who had been prophesied by somebody. I use that term, loosely is not even the right way to describe that term in this situation. They gave a word over somebody and called it prophecy. That they were supposed to get married. They got married. And all they ever did was fight and have trouble and have issues. Got part of the church split and left. A few, about, about six or seven years ago, they called me back, the husband did. And just wanted to repent for how they conducted themselves and how they acted. They let me know they had been divorced. 
But they just wanted to repent and say that they loved me and they were sorry that it happened and that it should have never happened. And um, how they conducted themselves towards us was wrong. And he just, you know, he, of course you forgive them. You know, I'm not forgiving you, brother. You don't have to, you know, but, you know, you need to get that right with God. Okay, I'll let you make the phone call. But I've already forgiven you a long time ago, you know. Uh, but, you know, I know you need to get this between you and God. So, okay. But they were prophesied to get married and never. You don't get married because somebody says, yeah, the Lord says y'all supposed to be together. There is no anointing called Cupid. You don't have, there's no anointing like that. Amen. I know a woman, and I'm, I'm, I'm over here. You may as well see me talk about these things. You've got to use the things you know to help people see some stuff. They're, you know, these stories are windows to your soul. There was, there was a, a couple in, in our church, Sister Prophecy, and, and someone that I knew and known for, uh, our family had been family relationship or friends with for, for years. And they had been in some, some bad lifestyles. They had gone, left the church. They had divorced their wife. They had gone out into some pretty ragged sin, got right with the Lord. Huh? Yeah, back on, that's back on where we came from. Um, and and they, got, they came back to the Lord, got some things straight, and came into the church that we were in, and started to pray in with this woman. Now, she's 20 years older than him. And that's not too bad if, you know, well, Nathan, can you do it? The cougar sound. Yeah, there you go, Greg. He's 37 and she's 57. And they got to pray. And, they, and so she's invited him to come up and start, they started praying together. And lo and behold, while they were praying, she started getting words from the Lord. You know what the words were? We're supposed to get married. If anybody you're dating or spending time with prophesies you that you're supposed to marry them, Run! Hogwash. You get Bible school students do this all the time. Somebody, some guy comes up to the girl and, well, yeah, the Lord showed me we're supposed to get married. She goes, oh, okay. Run! <laughs> but he loves the Lord. I know a lot of people went to the same Bible school I went to that don't love the Lord. Yeah. Bunch of spiritual charlatans showed up in town. Hello? Not all of them, but I know some that were. Hello? Some of them still living in sin. I mean, flat out homosexuality. Yeah. Smoking dope. Running around with women all over the place. And then prophesying some, and then going to prophesy that some girl is supposed to bury them. And they're dumb enough to listen. That's why you need a pastor like me. Don't be dumb. Run! <laughs> I don't believe in self-serving prophecies in that sense. When, it, when in particular, it deals with the will and the desires of another person. That is spiritual manipulation. When you're going to prophesy to somebody, they're supposed to do something... Subservient to your will and desire. Couldn't get that word out. Got it up. Thank God for tongues. It'll set you. It'll set you free. So we have to understand that this, this is not what I was going to preach. I was going for First Corinthians thirteen, the whole chapter on love. We're going to get there next week, obviously. But when we understand our roles in the body of Christ, when we understand why we're in the body of Christ, what we're supposed to do in the body of Christ. And we, we function within that. Now, let me say this. Your function in the body of Christ as your service and servant is not, uh, is not a replacement or a substitute or the same as your relationship with the Lord in your walk with God. Now, that needs to be right all the time. You need to be walking with the Lord. You need to be loving the Lord. That He needs to be number one in your life. You know? But your service for the Lord is different than your relationship. Amen. Cleaning the toilets does not earn you brownie points with God. No, it does not. It doesn't. But it is a function you're supposed to fulfill if that's what your calling is and that's what you're doing. You're supposed to do that to help the word of God go out. It is at your service in the kingdom, but it, you know, your relationship with the Lord comes before all that. 
You've got to love the Lord with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength, and your neighbor as yourself, da 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 and, and walk those things out. Hallelujah. And if you, if you could be serving the Lord by, by ser- cleaning the toilets and be a, a, be a uh, spiritual adjutant in the church, because your heart's not right. Amen. You can bring stuff into a service that don't need to be in a service. Now, you've heard me say this a couple times the past few weeks. There's something going on. Hello? I, if you say, Pastor, what is it? I don't know. I just know when I walked in, something was going on. I could pick it up in the atmosphere. Just, just something snarly. Now, let me say, can I say this? Get it straight or the Lord will. Now, you know, when, when I say that, uh, he hasn't showed me. That means he's going to. Mm-hmm. Meaning, if I'm saying it like that, in that general sense, he's giving you an opportunity to get rid of it before he deals with it openly. So if there's something snarly going on, get it straight. <whistles> Amen. Amen. There are times I've prayed for the boldness of Wigglesworth. Actually, I need to say boldness of Summerall because Summerall laid hands on me. Last time, last about a year before he died, I was in a meeting. He laid hands on us to impart things into us. Now, Brother Summerall testified and said he was not as bold as brash as he was until Wigglesworth laid hands on him. He was he was a very he was a very mellow, um, almost. Uh, afraid of a shadow type man until Wigglesworth laid hands on him. That boldness came off of Wigglesworth. And then we, we kind of, we, our, our thinking, Brother Summerall, was is a bull in a china shop. <laughs> but it didn't come on him until Wigglesworth laid hands on him. That boldness got, he's laid hands on me. And I, I, I fought it because sometimes I think, Lord, if I go, mm, mm, if I, mm, mm, I. So. We need to submit to our callings and to the Lord and have the right attitudes and the right heart and keep junk out of the church, it needs to be right in the house. We need to be playing our roles. We need to have a good attitude about it. We need to have the right heart about it. We need to keep ourselves pure. We need to keep ourselves straight. We need to keep the love channels open so that God can do what he wants to do. Keep it straight. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for the word. Thank you for the Holy Ghost. Thank you for what you're sharing and leading us to do. Hallelujah. Lord, we just we say, prayer adventure to be anyone among us that's not born again. We, we just pray you've dealt with them. Any among us that are backslidden, you've dealt with them. Anybody here in our midst not filled with the Holy Ghost, you, you've ministered to them. Say, heads are bowed, eyes are closed. If you're here this morning, you're not born again. And quite frankly, when we ask that question, we're not asking you if you're backslidden. We're asking you, have you ever been saved? Have you ever come to accept Jesus as Lord? If, you're not, if that's not you, raise your hand. I'm going to pray with you. Anybody? Say, Pastor, I, I'm, I'm born again, but I'm backslidden. I know what I've just left out. And I've gone out and started doing my thing. Well, your thing ain't going to cut it, and you know it. So if you're here this morning, you're backslidden, you want to get right with God, raise your hand. I'll pray with you. Anybody? Anybody here this morning, you're not filled with the Holy Ghost, you need to be. All right, look up at me, stand up.